Sure, so maybe just as a brief introduction, this is Florian Lawrence. And this is Joshua Grigsby. <laughs> Um, we are co-directors of Smarter Than Car. Um, Florian can tell you about it as he's the senior director. Senior co-director. We actually didn't, never had these titles before. Okay, so briefly about uh, Smarter Than Car. We uh, are a think tank on future urban mobility uh, and um, started in 2010 as, as China's first cycling NGO and relatively quickly turned towards uh, putting advocacy into into the, the urban uh, urban realm and also researching uh, urban contexts such as uh, the bicycle history of Beijing, which we found very interesting um, because it uh, it is an example of a of a mega city basically or a large larger city which was in the in the 1980s running uh, predominantly on bicycle mobility. And what we also studied was the, the current remnants of this very diverse culture, bicycles or pedal-powered vehicles used for retail, for all sorts of transport and, and other activities, for a service that is mobile and moves around over the cityscape, and also for shared mobility. So uh, situations that we, uh, five, five years ago, about five years ago when we started that work, were even less common than they are nowadays in, in Europe. And we are interested because we live in a car-dominated world where we as urbanists, we feel that this is maybe not the, the last, the final wisdom for how we treat our cities. And we will use this uh, day also today to discuss what could come beyond this, this mode of, um, this paradigm of urban development. So you just saw those pictures of the, the busy street uh, in New York crowded with cars, uh, a picture of a freeway in Los Angeles. Um, we see some of these, the infrastructure and ways of moving and the way that streets are used in particular, uh, and it seems so different from what, what we're looking at uh, in, in Beijing from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And there's something that feels uh, innately modern. It feels like it's, it's uh, proof that, that you've reached the modern age with cars and all of this infrastructure. But there's also something extremely perverse when you begin to look at it, even just from a, a design standpoint. So from a, a book, this is a, a very succinct quote that begins to sum up this uh, system that we have that, that surrounds cars from a, a book on, on product design and life cycle assessment. It's, there, there's a, a certain absurdity despite the, the freedom that it gives us and all these other you know, incredible benefits from the car, but of taking 10 tons of resources to create one ton of car which transports 100 kilograms of humans an average speed of 15 kilometers an hour for an average distance of one kilometer per trip, being used on average slightly more than eight days per year. Um, this is only possible with an immense amount of energy. And that's something that we begin to question more and more as we look at uh, some, some massive uh, shifts going on in the world. Of course, climate change, we know about, we're gonna hear some about that uh, this evening as well. Um, but uh, resource depletion, is, uh, if, if, if you've heard the, the peak oil debate really started boiling in the 1990s, looking at oil being something that we may run out of, the reality is probably not that we'll run out of oil, but that it will become so prohibitively expensive to extract that it will no longer be functional. And oil is central to mobility. Uh, mobility is the sector that uses more oil than any other, and nearly all energy in mobility uh, around the world comes from oil. So when we look at resource depletion, we look at the, the ecological effects, we look at the social impact, and then the, just the, the point of urbanization. The, the UN loves to have this statistic that they show, and depending on which, which uh, body of the UN you happen to see the statistic from, it's either 65 or 70 or 80% urban that the world will become by 2050. Whatever the actual number is, the point is that more and more people are living in cities. They're living closer together, depending more and more on each other, and using more and more resources. When we look at those challenges, then it brings up questions of a carbon budget. So how can we deal with climate change? Maybe it's a carbon budget. How can we deal with resource depletion? Maybe respond to peak oil. Um, with urbanization, how do we begin to, to handle a world that is 70% urban? Is it those same systems of the, the, the crowded street we see in New York or the infrastructure of freeways in Los Angeles? Probably not. Which begs the question, what comes after this? And this is really our, our biggest question. We look at something like Beijing, you see different paradigms around the world, and you know that no paradigm endures forever. Everything shifts. It's a transition is, is a fact of, of the world. So what comes next? 
that was where was the, the timing was very serendipitous. We, we received a, a call from Vienna Design Week asking if we wanted to curate this segment. Um, and we were really excited because it was a chance to involve uh, a different community working with design. Um, and what we developed as a theme was, was R&D, so research and design, and looking at post-carbon Vienna. What is the role of, of mobility in larger post-carbon transitions? How can mobility begin to deal with things like climate change, resource depletion, and, and increasing urbanization? Um, and, uh, and to take a, a sort of systemic look um, at mobility. Now, we'd, we'd had in our heads for a while this image. This, was, this is the, the Futurama exhibit from the 1939 World's Fair in New York. For those who haven't already gone through the exhibition or haven't heard us tell you about it, um, if you don't know, this was a massively successful exhibition uh, sponsored by General Motors. Um, the, the real genius behind it was that Norman Belgetis, who was an industrial designer, among other things, um, he made a pitch to General Motors and said, don't do what everybody else does at World's Fair, which is to show your product or your invention. He said, don't try and sell cars, because then you have to convince people that they need a car. And this was at a time where that was still very much in, in doubt, particularly in cities. There were, there were still protests. Uh, cities hadn't really been redesigned for cars. What he said was, redesign the vision of the future and make sure that that vision, vision depends on cars. And then you don't need to sell cars. It's automatic. General Motors supported it with a budget that today would be something like 200 million US dollars. Uh, it was a massive exhibition, a very realistic uh, look at, at what the world would be if you re-engineered it for cars, if you re-engineered the city, ways of living, everything. And what you got was a very top-down view, literally, as you were in this exhibit, you would move around it, and uh, a voice inside your chair, a motorized voice, a narrator, would tell you about how wonderful this future would be, uh, once you could conquer time and distance, live in the country, work in the city, have the best of both worlds. Um, it was a, a utopian view uh, at the end of the 30s as the world really needed one. So we had that kind of in our heads, and, and part of the question would be, if we were to do a Futurama now, uh, with a very different social context, a different environmental context, different ideas of urbanity and transportation, what would Futurama look like? So we did a call for designers. Uh, to our delight, we had a, a, a fairly large team. We have uh, 18 designers who ended up participating. We, because it's research and design, we, we needed the research side. So we also reached out to researchers from around the world and developed an advisory board of experts, some in Vienna, some international, uh, in a variety of fields, everything from transport planning, urban planning, to uh, sociology, history, engineering. And we, have, of course, had to reach out for sponsors. Um, and we were delighted as we went through that process to find how many different organizations, whether it was a, a, a public ministry, um, a private company, civic organizations, as we began talking, everybody seemed to recognize that vision of the Futurama isn't going to last. That's not our future. Um, everybody seemed to be in sync with asking the same question of what comes after cars and oil. It's maybe important to say that there is, we list the sponsors here, but there were a lot of people who supported the process by, by uh, giving us spaces, by, by providing their networks, and were supportive in many, many ways. So that was like telling about this interest and, and the, the, the interest behind like moving beyond this Futurama vision. Yes, and maybe just to say that there, there's really no reason why this project should have worked, given the amount of time uh, in which we were, we were trying to pull it off. And the only reason that uh, it is successful to whatever degree it is was because of how many people were, were involved and helped and contributed. So when we started the process, we thought, all right, with Futurama, this was essentially one vision, one guy saying, here's the future. We wanted to do the opposite of that and be as inclusive, as participatory, uh, to, to discover um, and begin to develop some kind of a process. So we began with a walk through the focus district for Vienna Design Week, uh, the 10th district here in Favoriten, and to observe what is the urban condition? Uh, how has Favoriten adopted many of the, the aspects of the Futurama? How will those, uh, where are the places that may need to change as we transition um, to a post-carbon future? We then followed that with a series of talks. Yeah, this was the kickoff weekend uh, in the mid of July, and everybody who survived it knows how hot it was. It was in mid July with more than 40 degrees. Uh, Stadtlabor of TU Vienna gave us the, the room to, to be used, and we had our guest experts um, giving introductory talks and uh, making a discussion about where we want to depart towards with, with this project. 
And also in this image you see Peter Norton, one of our experts from overseas. We didn't fly them in because of the carbon budget. Of course, we, we use Skype in this sense, but uh, Peter is uh, one of the top researchers when it comes to digging up the history of why the car uh, was, was becoming actually as important as it is nowadays. We also looked into some of the existing documents. So the idea, again, with research was to, to pull from what already exists. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, so with Smart City Vienna, we were, we were delighted. Uh, so many smart city projects uh, tend to focus on technology and um, cooperations with, with, uh, with large corporations. And while those things are not absent from the smart city uh, framework strategy, there's something much more inclusive. So we were able to pull out some of these goals from 2050 uh, that are in the smart city strategy that really begin to support where we're going anyhow. Um, I mean, it's, it's sort of remarkable to see uh, a document uh, from a city that says by 2050, no mobility in the city should depend on, on traditional fuels, on combustion engines. Um, there's no specific number for how little uh, the motorized individual transport should, should become, simply much less than 15%. Um, in the exhibit, uh, the exhibition, we use 5% as the number. Um, but you can see how, how these numbers are looking at uh, massive reductions in not only total energy, total greenhouse gas emissions, but per capita. And there's only so much that technological innovations can, can fill that gap. Uh, much of it has to come uh, from, from behavior change. And also on the last point, when it comes to quality of life, we want to explore which new qualities of life uh, can, can be created by shifting beyond the current system. There's, there's actually a great study that was done on commuting uh, called the commuting paradox. And what it found was that uh, even though the car has this lovely promise of freedom and in, in many cases delivers, when it comes to an urban context, uh, having to make a commute by car can be uh, extremely stressful psychologically. Um, they found that people who gave up uh, a, a 45 minute to 45 to an hour um, commute by car for a short walk to the office, it had the same effect on their happiness as finding a new love. And so the, the project also became a sort of exploration into, to quote one of our designers, Anne, into the post-carbon freedom. So this, this was a long process and, and very collaborative. Um, Florian and I, of course, as curators, we came in with some specific ideas of what we thought the, the exhibition should be, what we thought the topic should be, how it should be handled. Um, to our, our consternation, but, but eventually our, our utter delight, um, the designers had their own thoughts. Uh, and didn't simply want to take what we were doing and, and make those things visual. So it took some weeks, uh, lots of debating. You can see there are a few beers in the, in the foreground. It took a few of those as well. Um, but eventually to, to, to develop a path that everybody felt like they could contribute to and move forward with. Yeah, this is, uh, this is actually not the start of the meeting. This is a meeting because a lot of the people in our team have their day jobs just as we have. Uh, so this meeting started at 6 and I think this image is taken about uh, at 11 uh, at night so you know so that was that was like the the final goodie at the end of the discussion there were some some very long very long meetings and and out of all those we developed some guiding questions that we felt could create a bit of a narrative and and fuel the exhibition um, one of the questions of course is just how did we get here what led us to the place we're in now whatever that is um, secondly why does that trajectory have to change? Why does the, the course that we're on have to, have to become something different? Third is just, what are the building blocks then? If we're saying we're going toward a post-carbon future, what are the components? Not necessarily a vision for what exactly that will look like, but what are the pieces that inform that transition? Fifth is then, with those uh, systems coming into place, um, how do they begin to affect um, the way that we live, the way that we think? Um, is it something more than just uh, uh, about motion, uh, about moving goods and people from, from place to place? And then finally, instead of starting with, as Futurama does, with a, with a vision of the future, trying to come toward it at the end and not to have something entirely prescriptive that says this is what the future will be, but something a bit more descriptive in terms of possibilities. Um, what might a post-carbon Futurama look like? Best case, if we're able to, to manage these transitions uh, the, the right way, um, what sort of future could we create? 
Yeah, in all of this, uh, we, as to this year's Vienna Design Week takes uh, the 10th district as a focus district, we we also took uh, Wien Favoriten as a, as a case district uh, and used it to some extent to develop strategies or to to also have uh, a focus, our Futurama uh, representation happening in the 10th district, but it was important for us uh, to create strategies that can be also uh, in, inspiring the debate in, in other places around the world. And we also, as some of you uh, who have seen the, the exhibition, we made everything in English, uh, which is not very typical for, for doing something in Vienna, but we thought that this is of, of an international relevance and, uh, and we wanna, wanna have the debate in English. So here you see the, the nice exhibition hall, how it looked before we, we started the exhibition or before Vienna Design Week started the exhibition. It's uh, the first thing what, what takes place in this uh, space. So, so we were like, okay, we get these 70 square meters. Uh, what are we doing with it? This was the challenge, was, was to then take all of these big ideas and all these concepts and, and begin to actually make them into something concrete. Um, you're going to get a much more detailed view from the, from the designer shortly, but we just wanted to say this to sort of wrap up the, the process of how it all went, that it, after all the discussions, to walk into a space like this is, uh, is, again, both liberating because of all the potential, but also intimidating because of the lack of structure. Thankfully, the designers, again, were able to really step in and, and start forming the vision. So we went from, from this as an early view of how we would enter. You can see that there are sort of two doors uh, Futurama itself is something we wanted to take as a bit of a model, um, always kind of commenting on the original. Um, it's an enclosed space, so the idea is that you should, you, this shouldn't be something you can just pass by. You should enter it, you should have to be in it, it should be confronting you, um, you should move through something and then, and then exit finally. And you can see from the top view how it was beginning to come into place. Of course, we didn't know if any of this would work in practice. Thankfully, um, if you've been up there, you can actually see that it's come out much how the designers envisioned, um, and again, credit goes in many ways to them for, uh, for having the, the sort of understanding of, of reality and, and how all these things on a computer screen would develop in space. Um, but we were delighted to see this open. We hope that uh, you'll, you'll take a look through the exhibition. Um, if you haven't already, then tomorrow. And I guess just finally, to, just to mention some, some takeaways, some of the things that really came out of this process, um, things that we discovered from, from the research, from having the discussions with designers uh, and, and having to try and put something forward for, uh, for a general audience as well. One is that energy, space, and ways of living and thinking are inextricably linked. We see the, the car streets, we see the, the, all this infrastructure. Again, it's because we have a massive surplus of relatively inexpensive energy. If we don't have that energy, if you have enter an era of energy scarcity, all of that becomes very different and you have to think in a different way, you have to build in a different way, move in a different way. So these things are, are connected. Um, yeah, and, and mobility is the, the main thing what, what connects them uh, according to, to our viewpoint at least. And then when you want to build a sustainable city, that uh, one of the uh, factors is to, to create resilience and how can you build resilience by creating adaptive capacity. And this adaptive capacity comes from distributing a lot of the decisions and, and a lot of the, the processes which are happening in, in a city and building redundancies, uh, multiple uh, interactions into the system. Something what also by post-carbon mobility, uh, it's, po it's possible to support with post-carbon mobility. Um, urbanity is something constituted through the interaction and negotiation of difference. It's one thing to say that we're becoming 70% uh, urban as a, as a species, but that's just describing settlement patterns. There's something entirely different about ways of living in urban space, and this is something important to understand. The ability to negotiate, to have different people interact with each other, look each other in the eyes, uh, and have to decide how you move. Um, it's just like walking down a crowded street with a lot of people on the sidewalk. You don't just run into each other. The only way that you don't run into each other is you actually begin to acknowledge that there are people there. Um, this is a very, very important aspect of urbanity and something mobility can, can really contribute to. And when you look at urban mobility systems, we are faced currently with a system that is uh, defined by, by the car as, as the first uh, imp important factor. And, and when, you see, when you see how the, the behavior mediates that urban mobility system, you can think about, okay, how would a different uh, 
top mediator influence that system. And in our case, we, in the exhibition, we turned that from the car being basically environmentally friendly transport or active transport in, 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 the, in the first place. And trophic cascades, just to say, there's, there's a nice story about in, in Yellowstone how wolves were reintroduced. And when wolves were reintroduced, they changed the, the grazing habits of elk. They changed, there was this huge ripple effect uh, and eventually, actually, the rivers stabilized. They changed their course and stabilized as a, as a reaction to uh, different grazing patterns. Now, land wasn't over overgrazed, so the, the banks were able, to, were able to hold their shape. But the idea is that a change at the top of the food chain has this massive impact all the way down to many things you would never associate with the, with the initial uh, species. And in cities, uh, mobility systems are very much this way. You change the top mobility, the, the, the apex species in the mobility system, and it alters how you use space, it alters how you move, it alters how you interact with your environment. So it's understanding far more than just moving from place to place. And then, of course, as we are here at a design festival, that urban design can make that transition possible or, in the best case, pleasurable. So we are thinking about which, which design uh, interventions in the city can actually create a, a, a more livable place for us and a more pleasurable place. And we are very convinced about that, that moving into this post-carbon system will create new qualities of life and, and new, uh, a new urban condition that is, that is a, a, a different and a, I think more interesting quality than, than we have nowadays. The future will certainly be different than it is today. We're going to have to change many things, but often that's painted in a very dystopian light. And while dystopia may be a, a possible reality, um, there are many other possible realities, and we wanted to highlight that some of them are actually quite possible, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite desirable, um, and could actually uh, improve all of our quality of life. So thank you for the, for the, for the patience for the start. Um, we're going to hand this over to, uh, to the, our, our guest speakers.